Thank you all for joining us tonight for our talk about private school funding in British Columbia. First, as we begin, as always, I want to acknowledge that I live and work on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Coquitlam First Nation. My name is Ian Bushfield, and I'm the Executive Director of the BC Humanist Association. Tonight, you'll also be hearing from Adriana Tom, our policy researcher, who's helped out on much of this work and is responsible for many of the spiffy social media graphics you've hopefully seen on our Instagram page recently about private schools in BC. I see uh, Dr. Teal Phelps Bondaroff, our research coordinators, also watching along so you can uh, possibly hear from him in the questions if he uh, wants to chime in. For those who aren't already familiar with humanism, it is a worldview that promotes human dignity and ethical fulfillment without reliance on the supernatural. Humanism is, quote, committed to education free from indoctrination, and we support the global declarations of human rights like the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which asserts that children have the right to an education, quote, on the basis of equal opportunity. We believe in free and a multi we believe in a free and multicultural society, and the bedrock of such a society is a strong universal public education system. And that brings us to the topic of tonight's talk: pub private school funding in British Columbia. But before we begin, we have a few housekeeping notes. First, I believe your microphones have all been muted. Uh, out of respect for everyone listening in, I ask you to please keep them muted, except at the end when we'll have some time for questioning. Second, please hold all those questions until the end. It just lets the talk move a little bit smoother and possibly we'll even answer your questions as we go. We will be recording this talk as well to share on YouTube uh, and our podcast. If we have some really good quotes, maybe we'll put those up on our TikTok channel, which I encourage you to check out for some of the highlights of the BC legislature's prayers. And finally, as a small charity, we rely entirely on your donations to make this work and these events possible. If you're not a member yet, please go to bchumanist.ca slash join to sign up or make a one-time or monthly donation at bchumanist.ca slash donate. So let's get into it. I'm going to give a bit of the background of private schools in BC, how they exist, how they're funded, and where the money is going. And then I'll throw it over to Adriana, who will talk a little bit about, more about the arguments we're making around these schools and some of the specific examples we found of things we deemed WTF, weird that's funded. So for a bit of background, BC gives about $473 million in public funds to private schools. And so that's for this school year. That amount has increased from $358 million in five years ago, which is an increase of 32% over that period. That outpaces inflation and it outpaces the growth the relative growth in funding for public schools. And that's just in the time period that the BC NDP have been in government. The growth in private school funding has been pretty much consistent since they were first funded. The first private schools in BC opened in 1858 and in 1977, the social credit government of Bill Bennett began providing partial funding of some of those schools. In 1989, all private schools were brought under government re regulation via the Independent Schools Act. Uh, I found this funny because I'm a little bit of a student of BC political history, and this was the era of Bill van der Zam, uh, a premier who was known for the controversial um, fantasy land Bible theme park he owned in Richmond that uh, ultimately ended his political career. During that era, there was a Royal Commission into private school funding in BC, independent school funding, and that commission's results is what ultimately gave us the Independent School Act and the structure we have today, which is a four classification system. What I do find interesting about this is all private schools in BC are regulated. The government has the right to go in and inspect them. And I think this makes sense from at least most people's point of view as these schools do look after children. And as we've looked around the world at the various um, scandals and abuse scandals, uh, having some oversight of people who are responsible for children is probably the minimum we can do as a society. So most schools in BC, most private schools fall under either groups one or two. Group one are the schools that get 50% of the funding of a neighboring public school. So that means if $5,000 a year goes to a student who goes to Vancouver, uh, an elementary school in Vancouver, 
then $2,500 would follow a kid going to a private school in Vancouver. These schools must employ BC certified teachers, they must meet BC curriculum requirements, and they have to provide facilities that meet certain regulations. They can't just, you know, do it in their basement. They have to have a properly uh, regulated facility, a bricks and mortar school or an online school. The cost of running groups one schools as well cannot exceed that of a local public school. So they are budget limited to what a public school runs. And the idea there is they have to be more efficient, I guess. They have to make up the rest of that funding through tuition, and they probably don't want to charge more tuition than they have to. Group two schools have all the exact same rules, except they don't have that final one around funding limits, around their budget limits. So they can have operating costs as high as they want. The penalty is they only get 35% of the funding of a public school. So these schools have to make up the rest in tuition, and they don't really care how much they charge. So they tend to be your elite prep schools that are charging thousands, tens of thousands of dollars a year in tuition. Think your West Point Gray Academy, uh, any of your fancy schools where people, all the students are in uniforms. Group three schools and group four schools do not receive public funding. Uh, group three schools, at least 50% of the students have to be of school age and have parents who live in BC. Otherwise the school is a group four. So group four schools are basically international and overseas student schools and group three schools are ones that just don't want to have certified teachers or follow the curriculum. They do have to have some outcomes that are overseen by the government though. There aren't many of these schools and they don't get funding. So we haven't turned much attention to them. Uh, I'm not going to get too much into homeschooling in this talk. It's uh, its own realm. There's an entire section of traditional homeschooling in BC. That's your most unregulated element of, if you wanted to teach your own kids your own way with as little government as possible, traditional homeschooling is for you. Uh, you just have to make sure they are, uh, you have declared that you are a traditional homeschooler and then you can talk all about the dinosaurs you want. The final thing in the Independent School Act I will mention is that there is a requirement that every independent school in any of the classifications has to avoid programs that quote, in theory or practice would promote or foster doctrines of racial or ethnic superiority or persecution, religious intolerance or persecution, social change through violent action or sedition. So you can't start a full cult school that's planning to take over the government. Uh, you can't have your white nationalist schools at all. Uh, we could have a debate about whether some of the schools we'll talk about tonight are religiously intolerant. The government has deemed them not by the fact that they are, you know, approved and still running, but that is in the law. And I don't know of many cases it's, we haven't looked into whether that's been invoked, but it is an interesting aspect. So what does it actually mean to be inspected though? The government has within the ministry of education and many of you who have written letters kindly on our behalf to your MLAs will have gotten a response, possibly a form response from the deputy director. Uh, the deputy inspector of schools. There is a chief inspector of independent schools. This is the bureaucrat who oversees the department of independent schools within the ministry of education. Uh, a few years ago, we dug up some reporting and pieced together a little bit more to figure out who these inspectors are and have been over the years, because it's a pretty prominent job. If you are basically the person who is deciding which independent schools get to operate, get money from the public and so forth. Going back to 1985, which is actually before I was born, there have only been five inspectors in BC history. The first was Gary Ensing. He came to be a bureaucrat after working for the Society of Christian Schools of BC and for the Federation of Independent School Associations, which was the lobby group and still is the lobby group for private schools. He was appointed as the first inspector in 1985 and he served in that role till 1998. He was not the first nor the last Christian to serve in the role. In fact, every inspector has come from Christian education. The second one was Jim Beek, who was a former principal of Timothy Christian School. He was inspector from 1998 to 2005. Susan Penner followed him. She had been principal of White Rock Christian Academy and Credo Christian High School, and she served from 2005 to 2009. Then we got Ed Vanderboom. He was ironically Susan Penner's vice principal at White Rock Christian Academy, and he also was a principal at 
Credo Christian High School from 2009 to 2011. And since 2011, Theo Vandeweg has been the chief inspector uh, who was also a principal at Timothy Christian School, the one where T Jim Beek was. So between those five inspectors, most of them have come from two different schools in BC. Uh, Theo van de Weg also co-authored a children's or co-authored a book on religion and Christianity with Jim Beek, one of the other inspectors. So it's a very small world in the realm of inspecting private schools in BC. Now, we don't have any evidence or proof that these inspectors are biased. I just want to note the trend that they have all come from the same line of work. And you do have to imagine that there are only certain people who would want to seek out that job, and they're probably the people who already work in private schools. But I find it interesting, none have come from the elite private schools or the other secular ones. So the inspector's job and their team's job is to appoint the external evaluation committees. These are the groups of, I believe it's two or three in, uh, bureaucrats who go into an independent school every two to six years, depending on its classification groups, one and two get inspected every six years. And they do an evaluation and inspection. They look at the t materials being taught. They look at the certifications of the teachers and they look at whether the building meets all of the requirements. Like I'm assuming has to have a gym and you know won't fall down kind of thing. And otherwise, the inspector oversees the, you know, running of private schools and uh, their inspections. So we wanted to go through and classify all the independent schools in BC. We did this first in 2018, and we've updated it with Adriana's help this year. We were able to easily get the list of all private schools in BC off the Government of BC's website. They make that available annually with enrollment data, which is nice and useful for us to make our calculations. We then just simply Googled every private school's website and went through them to classify them based on their religion. If they said they were Catholic, we marked them down as Catholic. Um, a lot of them were vaguely Christian. They talked about Jesus. They talked about belief in God, and we couldn't do much more than just say, this is a Christian school. Uh, some would say they were Sikh, um, some were say they were Muslim and where there was no obvious religious connotation, we marked it down as secular. I think one or two even did say they were secular, but it's actually fairly rare. And there's 373 independent schools in the province. So it wasn't the fastest project, but it didn't take a super long time. At least it was valuable work though. Using then that enrollment data, the number of students in every school and the funding rates, which is available on the government's website for each district, we can easily calculate how much money goes to that school as an estimate. There might be some change, some adjustments based on students with special needs sometimes get additional money and we don't have that data, but this is a good back of the envelope estimate, I think. The one thing I do want to note is one special kind of group two school that is out there that we realized partway through this are the indigenous schools. There's about a handful of schools, about a dozen or just under where we had classified them as indigenous because they were based in Bella Coola. They have some, as an example, um, would have iconography of the local first nations or would, you know, directly say they were run by the local first nations. Those schools are all group two schools, which would typically mean they get 35% of the funding, but there is a special caveat in the independent schools act that lets the minister designate any school they want to get hundred percent of the funding of a neighboring public school. And basically every one of these first nations or indigenous schools gets hundred percent of the funding of a neighboring public school. And by being a group two school, it means they can exceed the operating budget of a public school in that area. So. I, you know, we could discuss that later. We don't have any specific quarrel with that kind of arrangement. And I will note that just this week, the Minister of Education introduced a new bill to actually amend how First Nation schools are running and give some more autonomy to uh, First Nations, which is uh, quite promising from a lens of reconciliation. And so that may all be changing anyway, but that's kind of outside the scope of what we were looking at. 
because we're mostly interested in the major religions and where the funding is going. So with that, I will show you our main diagram because that was the main goal here is to really visualize where this money is going. And there's a lot going on here because there's a lot of money at, uh, at play. We're talking $425,025 million. I don't know why this graphic says, oh, this is the wrong one. Shoot. Let me stop sharing that. I have it on my desktop. I pulled the one off, one of the ones off the website, which I apparently did not update. Let me share the right graphic with you. Here we go, the updated one. So $425 million. We couldn't account for some of the money that you'll remember off the top, I said it was closer to 470 million in total. We calculate, we figured out where about 425 million goes. The bulk of that money, um, 296 million or 297 million, which is nearly 70% goes to schools we deemed religious. And the bulk of that money went to Christian schools, as you can see, 265 million. Of the remaining money, 83 million or about 19.6% went to secular schools and about 10 or 11%, 45 million went to those indigenous schools I mentioned. Breaking down the religious schools, you can see it's almost predominantly Christian schools. Uh, we could argue about whether the Church of the Fundamentalists of Latter-day Saints, the Fundamentalist Polygamous Mormons are Christians or not. It's one school that got $630,000, so it doesn't make a big difference in our math. Uh, I think they consider themselves Christians and some scholars do, a lot of Christians don't. It, I put them in the other religions because they're funny, let's say. Among the Christian schools, most of the money went to, it was either Christian, not specified, 145 million, or Catholic schools, $104 million. This is very similar to the numbers we found in 2018. Uh, I think maybe a tiny bit more went to Christian schools than otherwise in the previous realms. There were actually a surprising number of Mennonite schools in the list that we were able to determine. Uh, as well as Seventh-day Adventists. They were basically the only two kinds of schools we could really identify. I think there was one Anglican school that was pretty large. Of the non-Christian religions, the largest amount of money went to eight six schools that received uh, $20.9 million. That accounts for about 4.7% of the, or 4.9% of the money. Uh, Sikhs make up 4.7% of British Columbia's population. So there's a nice uh, mirror there. Um, there were seven Muslim schools. They received 1.4% of all money, which was $5.8 million. And there's about 1.8% of BC is Muslim. And Jewish schools, there are five of them, and they received $3.8 million, 0.9% of funds, 0.5% of the province is Jewish. Now, 70% you know, of BC is not religious, according to the census. And 93% of religious people are not Christian in this province. So there's a big discrepancy in where the money is going in terms of the religious makeup. Uh, I want to come back to this Mormon school, this FLDS school. It is the Mormon Hill School in Bountiful, BC. It has 109 students this year and will receive about $632,000. We have filed a free of information request on this that we're hoping to hear back from to see a bit more about this school. I've read one in the past. The school is run by, or it was originally founded by Winston Blackmore. I think it's now run by one of his relatives. It might be his son or his brother. Uh, there was another school in Bountiful, Bountiful Elementary Secondary School. Uh, that one was run by Warren Jeffs, the other convicted polygamist of the community, but they had split. Uh, that one was shut down in September 2012. It doesn't have a good website, so we can't tell you what they're doing there, but hopefully we can learn a bit more from the inspection reports and the correspondence they've had with the ministry. Let's dig into the secular schools for a second. These are basically two different kinds. There's the group one secular schools, which are mostly Montessori, Waldorf, or sometimes special needs schools. An example I like to use is there's 
a school called Fraser Academy that was near where I used to live in Kitsilano, not to be confused with the Fraser Institute. The Fraser Academy was a school, I believe, for students with learning disabilities. There's a good argument for having schools like those in our society if those students do not feel they can be accommodated in the public sector. What I want to focus in on is the fact that $45 million went to group two private secular schools, which are largely the elite schools. Um, when we broke down all of the group two schools, there were 47 in total, excluding the indigenous schools, and 42 of those were secular. So there were only five group two schools that we classified as religious. And they may have just been the more historically religious, but more for like the religious elites, I guess. So the fact is most group two schools are secular, um, and most of the religious Basically, all religious schools are group ones. I'm going to stop sharing that now. Um, I'll turn it over to Adriana in a second, but I just want to close off with a few points uh, before turning it over to her. We've done polling on this, and British Columbians overwhelmingly agree with us that we should end funding of private schools in BC, particularly the religious and elite private schools, which if you'll read the letter we've drafted, that's what we're focused on. When we asked this question in our 2016 poll with Insights West, 63% of British Columbians opposed funding secular private schools and 70% opposed funding going to religious private schools. Insights West did the same poll pretty much in 2019 for another um, organization and found that 69% of British Columbians, again, opposed funds going to private faith-based schools and 66% opposed funds going to private secular schools. Uh, when you focus just on private elite schools, 78% oppose. There are very few people who think we should put public funds behind rich kids' schools, frankly. So the question is, why is the status quo the way it is if 70% are on one side of an issue? And the answer is that the private school lobby is very organized and they're very vocal. They have been working at this for decades. They write nonstop to elected officials. When issues come up, like in the last couple of years, the government has made some minor tweaks to uh, what's called distributed learning or online school funding. These schools raise hell. They have mailing lists because they know all the parents who send their kids to private schools. And so they can just send it in the newsletter home that you need to write your MLA and complain that your student will no longer have a school to go to. And I've seen the arguments many, many times. They focus on students with special needs, even though that is a vast minority of the schools we're talking about. Three quarter, more than three quarters of the funding goes to the schools that focus on religion or the elite. So we can, we can leave alone the schools for students with special needs for now, we can have that conversation about why they're not being accommodated in the public system down the road, but there's a need for a change. And so I encourage you to go to our website and send an email if you haven't already. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Adriana now, and she can continue to dig into a bit more of this and show us some of the fun that is being taught at these schools. Okay. Oh. Awesome. Um, so just overall, why are independent schools bad as a review? Um, they uphold barriers that segregate society and long sectarian and socioeconomic lines. Um, and kind of like breaking that down, some specific key points are that, as we saw, many of these schools are religious, many charge prohibitive tuitions, um, and also many participate in discriminatory practices. Um, and I had the absolute pleasure of going through um, the websites and handbooks and constitutions and social media pages of a number of these schools. Um, and I found some pretty weird um, and also kind of enraging um, case studies, um, things that are going on in BC independent schools. Um, kind of the first notable category of findings was um, schools that had um, the protection of heterosexual marriage kind of enshrined within their um, kind of constitutions or handbooks, which um, seemed kind of weird given that, you know, schools are places of learning and, you know, including 
um, kind of statements on why um, heterosexual marriage is like important, it seems kind of odd. Um, the other kind of broad category was um, creationism. Um, there were a number of schools that um, had statements regarding um, their belief that, you know, the Bible is like the true infallible word of God and that um, evolution does not line up with this. Um, and currently in the BC schools curriculum, Life Sciences 11, which I believe is formally, formally um, Biology 11, um, is supposed to talk about evolution and, you know, like plant species and all of that. But um, some of these schools, as I found in their course descriptions, had warning signs or talked about how, you know, this is not real or this does not line up with what um, the school actually believes. Um, and, you know, if a school is going to teach a course, they should probably, you know, teach the actual curriculum. But maybe that's just me. Um, then we kind of had just kind of the overall plain strange kind of category. Um, there was a lot of just kind of like weird things. Um, one school as I have right here that um, specifically listed like students are not allowed to like mention or have materials pertaining to the horror or cult. So um, they need to leave their tarot cards at home. Um, some weird things in admission policies um, at Pacific Academy. Um, one of the admissions categories was whether or not um, a student could um, speak in tongues. Um, another weird one too was um, for Seminary of Christ the King. Um, this is a school for um, young men discerning whether or not they are interested in joining, uh, becoming a priest. Um, and they specifically asked whether or not there is a history of mental illness in the family, which seems kind of weird as well. And just an, a number of kind of other weird things, um, schools asking for um, the marriage certificates of teachers um, they were looking to hire or parents as well. Um, one place that did not, um, they specifically included that they don't celebrate Halloween, why this pertains to um, education. I don't know, but um, yeah, there was a lot of interesting and random cases. Um, and if you've been following us on our social media, you've seen that we've been kind of slowly posting and highlighting uh, a different one of these case studies um, every day or so. Um, so kind of overall, why does this matter? Um, besides from being just kind of funny, um, it's also um, kind of upsetting. Um, these cases demonstrate um, like instances of discrimination and attempts to kind of normalize or pass these off as, you know, just cultural values or philosophical differences. And the um, independent school lobby, the Federation of Independent Schools Association, um, they develop a lot of um, like kind of guides for schools and crafting um, policies and constitutions. And one of their ones pertaining to discrimination, um, I have listed right here, and um, this is kind of their example, but saying that, you know, they will protect against students against like harassment, bullying, discrimination, all that, but they also are wanting to remain um, consistent with their, you know, own cultural philosophical values, um, which um, doesn't really seem to add up because, you know, you can't claim that you are looking out for the best interest of your students while actively promoting um, policies that go against that. Um, so just some kind of a few things if you are feeling a little upset about this. Um, some things that you can do to get information and learn more is um, look at our latest findings. We have a number of um, blog posts that kind of break down um, independent schools funding, as well as a number of these case studies. Um, we also have a handy tool on our website that allows you to send a letter to your MLA. Um, you don't even have to write the letter out yourself. It's right there. All you got to do is click send. Um, and yeah, that is all I have. So I'll just touch on a couple of the common arguments that I've come across and that come up quite regularly when we're discussing this 
I think the biggest one is this idea that parents should have choice or families should have choice. And it's such a weird argument to me because it's the students and the children who don't get talked about in this framing is this parent's rights or this parent's choice matter. When we focus on choice, we're not asking what's best for the student. We're not asking what's best for the child. And some of these families would say that, you know, their student with special needs does need a better school and that is for them. But in many of these cases, what they're talking about with religion is what the parent's religion is and the child doesn't really get a choice in that situation. Nevertheless, it, this idea around choice doesn't really answer the question. Baked into it is this idea, baked into choice is this idea that the market can help us develop better schools. I've seen it written back to me that, you know, we need innovation and competition in schools to see what the better outcome is. But schools and education is not like a cell phone. They don't get better through market forces. It's been tried in many different countries. That's not to say that government always knows best. Bureaucrats often don't. Uh, it does take a society caring about our education system to make it better, but schools are a very slow process to change. It takes 18 years, or we teach a ch child for 12 years in public education, right? A quick change won't be reflected for quite a while. I knew this in England where we I lived for a couple of years and they would change education policy drastically every three or four years when a new government came in. And they had no clue what was working. So they just kept testing things and everyone just got demoralized and it broke the whole system. So I don't personally think that's quite the right solution. But even if you do think the market is the best way to improve education, then why are we subsidizing the market? Like if we're free marketers, why are we intervening in the market and subsidizing these private schools? We should let them compete themselves and focus. And if they are that much better, they will prove it. Um, which kind of ties into this question and claim that private schools sometimes do produce better results. And we have tried to test this and we've tried to look around for good empirical studies of this, and there aren't many. Uh, there's some claims around uh, standardized testing, but there's a lot of criticism of those that, number one, private schools select which students they want and deselect ones they don't want, which immediately gives you a different sample versus a public school has to take everyone. So a private school can expel a kid, a public school can't most of the time. This means you have a very different baseline. Uh, the kids who go to private school do tend to be better off socioeconomically. And that means they end up doing better because most results we see across these things show that. And finally, standardized tests are just actually not a great way to know what a student is learning. You can just have a private school teach to the test, and that doesn't show that we've made better, you know, critical thinkers, which is a key part of the new curriculum here in BC. I think the strongest argument in favor of independent schools and the system we have are the students with special needs and those families who generally don't feel they are, can be accommodated in the public system. And I do think that highlights failures of our public system that we need to continue to challenge and push back on our government to make it more inclusive. What is the point of a public system if it's not universal? But as I mentioned, those are not the majority of schools. The majority of schools are ones for religious students. They are ones for the wealthier kids, um, wealthier families. And even among the secular ones, many of them are for Waldorf and Montessori's, and that's just a different educational style, which you could probably just argue they could pay for out of their own pocket. So there is more we can do in the public system. We should have more innovation. I do like personally the idea of where we seem to be heading in terms of indigenous education and autonomy, and maybe there is more room to think about that around uh, children with special needs within the public system. And finally, there's this kind of claim that private schooling represents the diversity of BC or that these private schools kind of promote diversity in some way by allowing communities to have those um, options. And I think our stats prove otherwise, that these schools are primarily just 
schools for Christians. It's just ways for Catholics and fundamentalist Christians, mostly evangelicals, to get some government money to teach their kids creationism and to hate the gays. Now, not all of the schools did that. We did not find that in every case, but we only looked at their public materials. We don't have spies in the classrooms because we're just trying to do a quick and easy uh, overview. But what ends up happening in these cases is we are segregating society, as Adriana uh, points out. We are breaking people up into little enclaves uh, and it kind of undermines pluralism and it undermines multiculturalism. We can respect multiple different viewpoints within a public system without having to have everyone have their own little corner. Research in the UK by Humanist UK and work done in the US shows that claims of school choice are really just a myth for most families. Even with subsidies and vouchers, the choice is really only available to the wealthiest segments of society. If you're a poor working class family, you don't have the time and capacity to fill out applications and shop around and drive your kids to private school. You're just going to have to put them on the bus to the nearest or send them to the nearest public school because it's becomes the common denominator. And that's one of the things that, you know, personally frustrates me about private school funding is it creates what Adriana called the two tiered system where there is subsidized schools for people who can afford it. But then there's the public system becomes a denominator rather than an aspirational goal. So I think we do need to fight for our public education system. It's something that humanists have long supported, the idea of promoting education. And this is a part of it. Thankfully, it's a small part of our funding system in BC. Uh, the public educa the BC Ministry of Education budget is about seven billion dollars. Uh, and this represents 470 million of that, but it's, so it's not insignificant. Uh, the extra money put in over COVID is less, I believe, than the amount we're putting in to private schools. So that gives you a sense of it. So we do need you to keep pestering your MLAs. Uh, we know that the private school lobby keeps pushing on this. I know you will have gotten those responses from bureaucrats. That's what they have to do. They have to send something to show they've acknowledged you. You don't need to write back to him. It's not the bureaucrat's job to change this. It's the politician's job to stand up for what the people believe in. So try and get an, if you get a response from your MLA or from their constituency assistant, try and get a meeting, try and get in there, talk to them, make your case in your own words. We'll be rolling out some additional information and tools to help you in those meetings. But we need to get better at talking to our politicians and to one another about why we think this is important. So I'll wrap it up there.